Hallelujah. So, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. We're sorry for the late start, but um, I didn't have it together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, before we get started, we want to make sure that we thank the Smoothie family for everything that they've done. Uh, and it's an honor to be here with all of you. Mike, won't you come up, brother? <clears throat> I've known this family for, I don't know, about over a year or so now, and uh, I've seen so much growth and so many good things happen to Mike and his family that um, I just want you to know how much I love you and appreciate you, brother. And then we have Jeff. Jeff, come on up. Because I, I've got to put him on the spot because uh, Jeff has not been out teaching for some time. Six, six years? Six years. And it's also an honor to be able to, to have him here. And he is a mentor of mine when it comes to the language. And um, I just want to thank you for being here, brother, and accepting it. And so we'll go ahead and sound the shofar. We're going to go ahead and get into this teaching this evening. I'm going to kind of break it in slowly. And we'll, give, we'll hand it over to, uh, I could say Brad, but I won't. <laughs> we'll hand it over to Jeff. And, and he'll be getting a little bit, a little bit more in-depth because I know there's people in here that are on a little bit different level, each of us. So I'm going to bring this teaching, the first century assemblies, and uh, make sure that everybody understands what our role is uh, as an assembly of people and where our roots are. And we'll be doing a Hebrew word study during this time that will um, show us how looking at the ancient Hebrew text and the letters can change your overall view of not only a verse, but the whole passage. Because Yahweh has called us to worship Him in spirit and, truth. and in truth. So the overall objective is the more we study the original form of the language, the more we're able to worship Him in truth. And it's His Ruach, His Spirit, that leads and guides his people to these understandings. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together as family, as Mishpacha. We want to thank you for the word that will come forth today. We want to thank you so much as we enter into your Sabbath, and we want to say Shabbat Shalom to you, Father. And we just invite your spirit to be present with us as we study your word. Father, let us decrease that you may increase in our life. And we just give you the praise and the honor and the glory and the blessings that are due your name. And we thank you so very much for the blood of the covenant. And we pray this in the precious name of Yahshua. Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu, Melechai Olam. Blessed be Yahweh, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commands, redeemed us by the blood of his son, Yahshua, and given us a command to hear and respond to the call of the shofar. <laughs> quite a bit out of the passages in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. But before we get into that, setting the stage here, we're going to be taking a look and focusing at these seven assemblies that were set up in Asia at the time of the first century. And what we're going to be taking a look at is this concept that the, the New Testament, if you will, assemblies were set up in the first century. And we're going to be taking a look at this word church, and we're going to be taking a look at, at its roots and where it was actually formed. Then we're going to be taking a look at the ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics to see what exactly this word, kahal, means. All right?
So, when it comes to the first century assembly, who were they? We've been led to believe that the first century assemblies were Gentiles who Yahshua called in place of Israel or the Jews. We have also been led to believe that this church was formed in Acts chapter 2. And what we're going to see is these te that neither of these teachings or these statements that has been fed to us are actually accurate or true. I submit to you that what has taken place in Acts chapter 2 was a reestablishment of a covenant, a marriage ketubah, from Mount Sinai. Therefore, it was a calling of the same people. Israel is right here in this room. He is calling us to gather once again. And when we take, hallelujah, when we look at these ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics for this word church, there is something so significant to it because it has to do with time and gathering and shepherding and revelation. We will also see the undeniable fact that the body of, at Mount Sinai is the same body being spoken to in the book of Revelation. If we go back and we look at what happened after Mount Sinai, he began to warn them right away through the prophets. You're leaving your first love. The obedience. We were not seeking the tamim, the perfectness that the Torah is able to actually do in our lives. And he warned them and that it, is, it has been recorded for us and we can receive testimony as to what not to do if we wish to be his people. You know, they, they, they were sawn in two, beheaded, that we could receive these testimonies. How, how important is it for us to actually understand what Yahweh was speaking through Moshe and the Nebium or the prophets. It's of utmost importance that we begin to understand and to correct ourselves so that the same thing that happened to them does not happen to us. Because He loves us and He's called us to repentance through His Son, Yahshua. Hallelujah. So I pulled this right out of the King James. And I will be using the, uh, the correct names and titles throughout. Um, Acts 7, 37 and 38 in the King James Version reads, This is that Moses. Now remember, this will be after Acts chapter two, 1 and 2, where they say that the church was established. In Acts 7, 37 and 38, the King James, King James Version reads, This is that Moses, which said to the children of Israel, a prophet shall Yahweh your Elohim raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. We need to understand that first and foremost. This was going to be a prophet that would come like unto Moshe. And Moshe presented the Torah to the people. So if we've been led to believe or follow a Savior that is not teaching or saying that we should follow the Torah, then that's probably not the one that this was speaking about. Right? Like unto Moshe, him shall ye shema. Him you shall hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Wait a minute. Okay, now this is the King James Version. And, they, and most people using the King James today are telling us that the, that the church or assembly was established in Acts chapters 1 and 2. But just further into the same book, it says that the church was in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him at, in the Mount Sinai. Uh-oh. So now we have scriptural testimony that is saying that the church did not originate on or in the first century in Acts chapters 1 and 2. And look at what was handed down at Mount Sinai. Can we understand what took place that day? 
they were there on Shavuot. And they were about to receive the Ruach HaKodesh. This covenant, this marriage ketubah with the king. And what did they do? The same thing many of us have done. But we have received the revelation to come out from among that and be separate and come back to the lively oracles or the living words that were given at Mount Sinai, which is the marriage covenant that is directly connected to all of the Torah in the Torah and the Ten Commandments themselves. So here we see that the angel spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. The oracles that were given on that day is what we live by. Yahshua said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. And he never did away with the words of his father. He said, I, did not, I do not speak my own words but I speak unto you the words of my Father. So we can't have two different doctrines and two different words being spoken. The Son would have never done that. So the fathers of the assembly, now called the church, were those at Mount Sinai, not Tertullian, Origen, Eusebius, which are all considered today in the church as church fathers. And as we're going to see, that is significant. These men were all Greek and Latin converts for the most part. And the fathers received the living words at that time. The assembly did not emerge in the first century. They were regathered. They're being re we're still being regathered to this very moment. So church is the Strong's Greek number 1577, Ecclesia. And the Strong's defines this word, a calling out a religious congregation, synagogue, members of such on earth or in the Shemayim or heavens. Now, because of these books that we have today, we can actually go from the English word in the New Testament, and we can take the polyglot, and we can find where that word is also used in the Septuagint, and it's coded to the Strong's Greek numbers. So you snatch your English word, then you find where it's used in the uh, Greek Torah, then you look that chapter and verse up in uh, your Strong's and get the Hebrew number, then you go directly to Jeff's much desired, <laughs> this has become one of my major tools in my studies, and you can get back to the ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics in minutes. We just went from one of the languages that was breathed out after battle, and our language is one of the worst that has evolved from that. Back to what was uttered prior to battle. So this is the Hebrew word kahal. Strong's Hebrew number 6951, and they have it as assemblage. So right away we see church totally disappear. Even in the Strong's definition, right? We see church totally disappear here. In the ancient Hebrew lexicon, it's number 1426 GN on page 244. The concrete word there is flock. Now, how many sheep do we have in the room today? <laughs> okay, so it, it, uh, the lexicon has this concrete definition, a gathering of the flock to the shepherd. Now, I want to call your attention to your charts. You see the kuf here? It's a picture of the sun on the horizon. Now, the Hebrew mind works a little bit differently yeah, than the modern English mind and Greek and Latin mind, Western mind does. So here we have kuf, hay, lamed. This is the picture of the sun on the horizon. Then we have the hay, which is a little a picture, of course, of a, of a little man with his arms raised. This is Yahweh speaking to children in the language that he gave to his first child. This is something so easy to understand once you uh, initiate the books and you look at the concrete definitions. It's just phenomenal. 
So we have here, this has to do with time. <clears throat> so we see that the concrete definition is flock. So this is talking about timing and the flock and gathering of that flock. Then we have the hay, which is a revelation, or to behold or look upon something. Then we have the lamed, which means to guide, to teach. You see, that lamed, that shepherd staff, invokes the thought in Hebrew of a shepherd. And that shepherd is shepherding the flock and gathering. And in these last days, he's using this alphabet, I believe, to do it. You see, there's a remnant spoken about that would come back to this pure tongue. And it doesn't mean that every one of us will be able to speak Hebrew. But he's restoring and giving us understanding about what was originally uttered from the mouth of Yah. We don't need translators anymore to come up with another version of the scripture. We need the books to research it ourselves and ask for guidance of the Ruach HaKodesh and come into the body of Yahshua underneath the covering of the blood so that he can give us what he wants to give us when we are gathered to him. That's always been his plan, is to walk among his people. That's what kings do, by the way. The, or the Hebrew king does. He got off his throne and he walked out amongst, amongst the people. How are you doing? Man? Pretty good, sir. You see what I mean? He got off the throne and he began to walk in the camp, but the camp became defiled. And that's his will and his wish is that he can once again walk among us, bury that side, out, that stuff outside the camp, and let's move on with this marriage ceremony. That's why we see the marriage ceremony still appointed in the book of Revelation. It was interrupted at Mount Sinai. So this kuf, meaning it's a picture of the sun on the horizon and time, a lot of people think, okay, well this can have something to do with the separation of light and darkness. No, not really. I was speaking to Jeff about this earlier. You see, when the sun comes up on the horizon, the light doesn't all of a sudden just, I mean, it will become, it will shine forth, but what it does with the Hebrew mind, it begins to gather. The light will begin to, to gather at the mountain or the horizon. So the light begins to gather, then it shines forth. So the shining forth is not the the first action of the light, the gathering is, then the light shines forth. The good news is all over these three little letters that they have brought to this. Three little letters give us the good news right here. A flock being gathered, the light, he said that you are the light of the world, right? And when we are gathered, that is what is going to happen. We are going to shine forth to others. Does somebody light a light and put a, a basket over it? And that's what we've done. We've repented and we've come to the knowledge of the truth. But we really don't know. And I don't want to say all of us, but there, there are many, many people that really don't know. Once, What do I do now? In other words, what do we do now? We seek righteousness, holiness, modesty cover ourselves because we uncovered ourselves this word kahal in its in its purest form means a gathering together of the flock towards the light to the revelation of the shepherd so we see here by definition that these assemblies of people were be, were being gathered starting in the days of Moshe as the flock of Yahweh coming to the great shepherd. We already know that there was sin in the Garden of Eden, so now what he has to do is bring us to the knowledge of the great shepherd. How many of us in the room have came to the knowledge of the great shepherd? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are now being gathered. Correct? All right. So here's the warnings that were brought to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 5. And what we're going to do is we're going to connect this to the, we're going to see that these are the same types of warnings that were given to the church. 
the assembly in the first century. Remember those first seven assemblies that we looked at in Asia? It's these people who were cast out into the nations. These are the laws and right rulings which you, which you guard to do in the land which Yahweh Elohim of your fathers is giving you to possess. All the days that you live on the soil, completely destroy all the places where the nations which you are dispossessing serve their mighty ones, on the high mountain and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall break down their altars and smash the pillars and burn their ashram with fire and you shall cut down the carved image of their mighty ones and shall destroy their name out of that place. Do not do so to Yahweh your Elohim, but seek the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses out of all your tribes to put his name. So, we failed miserably at that as a people. He gave us warning after warning after warning. And then he also warned the first century assemblies of the same thing. To put his name there for his dwelling place and there and there you shall enter. Deuteronomy 12, 28 through 30. Guard and obey all these words which I command you that it might be well with you and with your children at, with, after you forever when you do what is good and right in the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim. When Yahweh your Elohim does cut off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, guard yourself. Guard yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. And that you do not inquire about their mighty ones, saying, How did these nations serve their mighty ones? And let me do so too. So what we're supposed to do once we're gathered and brought into the body of Messiah, we're supposed to compare what we're doing now to what we did in the church. If we see remnants of church within us, and we know where a lot of the church came from, then it would probably be very uh, smart for us to root out these traditional things that may be connected to things that Yahweh does not want us to do. The thing about, let me explain something. The thing about a prophecy, it comes from a prophet. And a prophet is Nebi, Nebia or Nebium in Hebrew. And it begins with the new. And a lot of teachers today will say, well, that prophecy was fulfilled. Or it, it happened to Israel. Now it's over. But the thing about the seed, the noon is the picture of a seed, if you look on your chart. And it can mean continue. So the word that was spoken through the prophets is not the prophet's word, but Yahweh's word. And Yahweh's word is eternal. So that seed that was prophesied through that man will continue to unfold until Yahweh says, all is done. We can't stop what he spoke through Moshe and the prophets. And the church is having a student. So then they didn't listen and they were scattered. Deuteronomy 4, 27-30. And Yahweh shall scatter you among the people. And you shall be left few in number among the Gentiles where Yahweh drives you. And there you shall serve mighty ones the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you shall seek Yahweh. How many people we have in the room that are seeking Yahweh today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And where are we at? We're in the nations. Why? Because we were cast out. This is speaking to us. We are the kahal. We are the assemblage, if you will, of Yahweh Almighty. You know the thing about Yahweh is He's loyal. He is trustworthy and He is faithful to do everything that he said he was going to do. And I'm a living testimony that if we keep covenant with him, that he will. He is life changing. If we choose to change our life with his word, he will actually change your life. 
But from there you shall seek Yahweh, your Elohim, and shall find Him when you search for Him with all your heart, with all your being, in your distress, tribulation. Has anybody been hard-pressed lately? Mm -hmm. Does this world ever come against you? Every day, it's something not new, but something different. And it's been plaguing His people since the Garden of Eden. But we've brought it upon ourselves. All we have to do is walk Shema, hear and obey the word of Elohim. In your distress, when all these words shall come upon you in, in the latter days, then you shall return to Yahweh your Elohim and shall obey His voice. You know the same thing that's being laid out here through Moshe was also told to Abraham. He told Abraham, your seed's going to be scattered. This is a great prophecy. It came directly from Yahweh. So here we see after uh, the northern ten tribes, of course, were already in bondage. Now we're going to see a time uh, when Yehuda was also taken as well. So in Lamentations 1, 1 through 3, we see how alone she sits. The city once great with people. Now remember, look inside of yourself and remember how great we may have thought we were. How great we thought we were, but how empty we became. See, we can learn a lot of things from these things that happened to our brethren in these days. Because I know when I came to the knowledge of the truth, and I began to study the languages that the scriptures are given to us in, that I became empty, and I, I began to understand, you know what? It's true that we have inherited only lies, and only the truth can set us free. Like a window she has became, one great among the nations. A princess among provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitter, bitterly at night, and her tears are upon her cheeks. Among all of, all of her lovers, there is no comfort for her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. Yehuda has gone into exile because of the affliction and because of harsh labor. She has dwelt among Gentiles. She, the Kahal, the bride. She has found no rest. I get this question all the time, and I pray for my brothers. There's one here locally that I've been constantly in prayer about over the past couple of days because he was where he needed to be. And you know what? The enemy is slapping him around. But you know what? We're going to pray. We're going to pray for that brother. Sometimes things will plague us to the point that we have no rest. Literally. Laying down at night going, will I ever be able to overcome these things? These words are alive and they are speaking to us because from us will come the bride of El. <clears throat> Gather my flock. Now we're going to go into the first century. Now remember, they had been cast out into the nations in the dispersion. Matthew 10 5 and 6, Yahshua sent these twelve out, having commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Shemaranites, which is Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael. We set up some assemblies now, right? Call. Luke chapter 24. Verses 46 through 47, speaking of Yahshua, it says, And Yahshua said to them, Thus it has been written, and thus it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in His name to all nations. What did He tell us in the, De in, in the passage of Deuteronomy? To tear down all the idols... Right? And to lift up a place that bore His name. Mm -hmm. Correct? Here we see the continuing of that. Beginning at where? Yerushalayim. 
Brother Jeff was talking to me about this uh, yesterday about, I believe, Paul or Shaul. How it says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, he noticed a pattern that every time Shaul went out, he went to a synagogue first or a place where they congregated and he reached out to the Jewish people first. But if they wouldn't receive it, he would go to the the Greeks. Right. See, so this is a pattern. Now, so if the if the if the gathering of the flock is for the lost sheep of Israel, what are we doing in this room, everyone? <laughs> We're receiving our calling back into the body because there's a marriage about to happen. So, the assemblies of Asia came from that command for all of them to go out and to teach the good news, to gather the sheep. As we will see in the study of the following verses, the same warnings that went out to Israel in her days of rebellion have gone out once again to the assemblies in Messiah. We have been warned. This brother's going to begin reading here. Uh, I'll interject every now and then, but we're going to try to read straight through this. Now remember, what he told them, don't do this and don't do that. He gave them fair warning, and they still did it. That's why they were out in the nations to begin with. So then he sends messengers. I see some very knowledgeable men in this room and very dedicated women and children that are going through the same exact thing that we're reading about right now. He begins to warn them again. Don't leave your first love. Tear down the idols. Proclaim my name. Lift it up. Put it within your heart. Write it on your doorposts. Keep my laws and my commandments always before you. Go ahead, brother. Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Revelation 2. To the messenger of the assembly of Ephesus write, He who is holding the seven stars in his right hand, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, say this, I know your works, your labor, your endurance, that you are not able to bear evil ones, and have tried those who who say that they are emissaries and are not. Okay, stop right there. So here what we he told them, I want you to tear down their idols, right? And he's telling them the same thing. You're not receiving the evil ones into my assembly. Hmm? Go ahead. And have found them false. And you have been bearing up and have endurance and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. See this? He told them, tear down all the idols and lift up my name in the place that I choose to dwell. It's the same exact teaching coming out to the descendants of the people who were originally cast out of the nations. But I hold this against you, that you have left your first love. Wait a minute. They were baptized in the name of Messiah. They had entered the body. Mm -hmm. I thought we were okay then. They were going to the assembly. We've been to Idaho. We've been watching Elliot.com. We've been watching Jeff Benner. We've been watching all the, isn't that, isn't that enough? We need to wake up. And we need to understand that there is something to be done here. Something that we've been missing. And I submit to you that this language will show you what that something is. Is everyone in the room comfortable where they're at out here in the nations? Our goal should be to seek out the things that this language will show us that's a little bit different in some areas than our English Bible and to continue to grow towards the kingdom reign because that is the goal, is to get back into the land. He's not going to take a church that has received a lawless doctrine. He kicked out people before Israel that were lawless. Got rid of them. Right? Then he brought Yisrael in 
And then he kicked them out because they were disobedient to the Torah. So then he's going to erect a church that is taught to be obedient, disobedient to the Torah and replace them with them anyway. Might as well just let the first people stay. <laughs> so it's through Shema hearing and obeying that we actually come back into this covenant. We're covered in the blood of Messiah. Now we are preparing ourselves for this marriage and coming back into the house. Hallelujah. So remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works. For else I, or else I shall come upon you speedily and remove your lampstand from its place. Wait a minute. We serve a loving Elohim. He loves us, right? There's got to be a certain level of grace and love here, Teddy. Well, you know what? If the blood of Messiah isn't enough and the beating that he took so that we could be alive today and have the opportunity to come back into covenant with him if that's not enough love and grace in your life then I think you need to reevaluate the way you look at the one who died for you because we should respect the blood of the covenant and it should put something inside of us that wants us to draw closer to him because he gave his life for us and he's trying to gather that. He's trying to coof. He's trying to get us to gather because we're supposed to be the light of the world. Unless you repent. Yet this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he also, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. See that? Hear. Shema. The same exact words are spoken again that we read in the passages of Debarim. He said, Shema this. It's the same thing that he told us just Shema before he kicked all of us out. Now remember this Nicolaitan thing, and this is where we're going to probably end up. I'm going to speed things up a little bit so that um, we can get uh, Jeff in here. But this is very, very uh, critical that we understand this word Nicolaitans. There's all kinds of doctrines out there about it, but I want to submit something this evening that maybe is a little bit more tangible, something provable. And I'm going to pick up where Elder Trainer left off years ago, and this was an anointed man of Yah, and those of you in the room that have been around for a while know who Trainer was. He just did not have many of the things that we have today in order to research these things. We're going to pick up where he left off. I'm going to read a little bit out of that. Go ahead. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> and let, okay, and let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him that overcomes, I shall give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of Elohim. Okay. And to the messenger of the assemblies in Smyrna, write, this says the first and the last who became dead and who came to life I know your works and pressure and poverty yet you are rich and the blasphemy of those who say they are Yehudim and are not but you are a congregation of Satan uh oh yeah. Well, yeah, let's, let's keep going. We'll yeah. get to the Nicolaitan stuff. That's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> uh, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. See, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison in order to try you, for you shall have pressure ten days. Be trustworthy until death, and I shall give you a crown of life. Okay, so let's skip over to chapter 3. And let's read a little bit there. I just want to lay a little, little bit of the foundation because there were some problems going on with these assemblies. And I see problems or shortcomings in the assemblies that I'm affiliated with, with the people that I love as well. And what this whole teaching is, is meant to do is spurn us a little bit. We became idle in many areas of our life. We should continually press forward toward the goal not sit there and look at the goal we do it all the time well if Yahweh opens a door for me 
But pray and say, well, Father, if this is your will, open a door. Open a door. And you know how many times I've seen people pray that prayer and I pray that prayer with them. And then I see three doors open. And you know what we do? We go. He just opened. Look at that. Not only one, but two, three doors. There's three different options here. And then we sat there for months looking at these doors. And we never walked through them. And then when they close, because he's the one that openeth and no man closeth, and he closeth and no man openeth, when they close, after so much time, we go, well, I guess it just wasn't his will. We are failing to understand what Shema means. When the door opens, you got to step through it. There's work to be done for the kingdom. There's people that need prayed for. There's people that need healing. We need personal growth in our life through the study of the word. We need people going out on the road and immersing and reaching out to the people who cannot get to the assemblies. There is work to be done, and it's toil and being under pressure at all times. But you know, meat's tender when it's pressure cooked. Right? And the fat falls right off the bone. Yahweh said, fat's mine. What I want to focus on here, throughout those scriptures, we keep seeing this Nicolaites or Nicolaitans in most English versions. It comes up and being lukewarm. These are things that will cause us to have problems. And if the assemblies of Yahweh think that you can just be, you're all right where you're at, He is through the, throughout these verses talking about removing your candle out of the candle stand. We can love doctrine people right to the grave. We can. Are we supposed to love? Absolutely. We're supposed to love, care, and nurture one another. But when it comes to these issues about obedience, modesty, whatever, we are failing in areas, and it's causing the people around us to think it's okay. And it's not. He was telling us that he's going to remove stuff, not continue to bless. So remember the severity and the goodness of Elohim. We've got to balance that out. Definitely have to balance it out. We can't rely. I don't want to have to use a drop of the blood every day of my life. I want to be able to apply that blood to somebody else's sitting. That's what the Torah is for. So that we can show up in front of him and say, thank you for calling me into your assemblage. Can we use a little bit of the blood that I might have used up for someone else. That's what obedience to the Torah produces. We're showing respect for the blood that was shed of the covenant. Hallelujah. So, the problems here were the Nicolaitans and being lukewarm. Lukewarm is Greek number 5513, and it means to warm, tepid, slightly warm. And what did he say about these people that were lukewarm? Okay. So, why would a loving redeemer do that? Because people who are lukewarm will cause somebody who's hot or cold to be lukewarm. <clears throat> he doesn't like it. So we as a people who claim to be followers of Yahshua should be creating people that are hot with modesty. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. A bride that is covered. A bride that is modest and moral. And that begins with you, men. Your eyes. It begins with the men. The window of knowledge is the eye. So when the eye of the Creator created, He began to cover and separate and do all of these things because He wanted His creation to be covered. Hallelujah. Not exposed. So it begins with you, men. If your eye is undressing the sisters, <laughs> come on. Feel me? So this being warm is not acceptable to Yah. 
So we need to focus on that. We want to we want to create things that are proper so that we can actually get people back into the kingdom because lukewarm people apparently are going to be standing outside. He doesn't like it. Then we have um, the Nicolaitans. Now this is one that I've seen so many doctrines concerning this, but let's try to simplify the matter. Greek number 3531. Now this is the, and I don't agree with it, but I'm going to put it up here. Um, a Nicolite, a follower of this guy they say was Nicholas, a heretic. Now, the problem with that is I personally cannot dig up any information on Nicholas that was a heretic with the following of people. That's, that's me. I've seen a lot of things written about it, but I don't see anything concrete to say, well, yeah, that's it. So what I want to do is Elder Trainer, who is no longer with us, he left behind some information that he was on. I better get my eyes on here. Elder Trainer writes, these Nicolaitans have been masquerading with us for a long time and have made converts of us all. Whether we admit it or not, we have all been made drunk out of their milk bottles, which milk has been drawn from Mother Babylon's breasts. It is no, long, it is no wonder Isaiah, who was told to inquire, to whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then to make sure we would get the right answer, he continues, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast in Isaiah 28, 9. And what this elder was seeing is that in order to create a set apart and sanctified people, we had to quit feeding off of a drinking adulterated milk. Let's put it that way. Then he goes on to say, Revelation 2 or the second and third chapters are prophetic of the history of the church or assembly and depict its transformation from the apostolic faith to Babylonian apostasy. Now, I can't remember exactly when he wrote this, but it's been many years ago. So the elders back then were seeing this invasion of Babylonian concepts into the assemblies that bore Yahweh's name. So, I want to pick up from there because I dug into this. And actually, this is a this is a compound word, this Nicolaitan thing. It's two Greek words. It's not a it's not even a noun. Personal noun. It's not. Um, so let's look further, uh, look at further evidence that confirmed uh, Elder Trang's findings here. The laity of what we think is pronounced Nicaea. Actually, if you guys are wearing Nike shoes, that stems directly from the same root line, even in the Greek. This term was now deemed as a noun was in fact a group of people in Nikea, see the Greek, Nikea, the, uh, the place called Nikea where the first councils took place was originally called Ancor. So that place over there that we call Nicaea was not originally Nicaea, it was a place called Ancor until Alexander's men showed up and conquered and then they surnamed it after the place they were from. So it was originally called Ancor until Alexander's men took it over in war, then named it after Nikea in Locris near Thermopylae. So it appears that the doctrine referred to in scripture would have been that of this Greek origin then spreading into the assemblies by way of the Greco-Roman empires, which really emerged in the third and fourth century as powers, superpowers, super religious powers, if you will, of the common era. Now remember these dates. So let's investigate where Yahshua's assembly came from. Matthew 16, 15 through 18. Now remember, he said, I want you to sanctify my name. 
and I want you to tear down the altars of the names of other mighty ones, right? And then he gets on to these guys because they were beginning to do things that were inappropriate in worship with him. But then he said, but I do appreciate you keeping my name sanctified, correct? So this is when Yahshua sets them all down. He says, and who do you say that I am? Because everybody's saying, well, he's one of the prophets or this guy or the, this guy. So Simon Kepha answering said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. And here we see that in the first century, they would have been using the name Yahshua. So he says, and Yahshua answering said to him, blessed are you, are you Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father in the heavens. And I also say to you that you are Kepha, and on this rock I shall build my assembly. On what rock? When he said, you are Yahshua, the Messiah. That's a stone, Yahweh. right, well, or some say Yahweh, Shua, that could be debated. But. So, he says that he's going to build his assembly on us coming to the knowledge of repentance and confessing that Yahshua is the Messiah, therefore causing us to sanctify the name once again, tear down the idols, hallelujah. And the gates of the grave shall not overcome it. So this is how the assembly was set up, by confessing on the true name of the Messiah. And this is what they were uh, commended for in the book of Revelation as we just read. So, looking back at the prophecies, looking back at the book of Debarim, where he began to set forth this plan that if you do not keep these commandments, tear down the idols, how many idols could one have in their heart? <coughs> we could have many idols. It could come in the form of uh, television. It could come in the form of anything. So we're supposed to tear those things down and replace it with the name of our mighty or our Redeemer. So can we, as the first century assembly has escalated into now, fast forward the tape. So today, can we say that we've honestly stuck to our first love, kept the Torah, and stuck close to this covenant name. As we can see, this is the same body of people that is sitting in this room right now that he told. So I, what I'm saying is somebody in, the, in your family, your great, 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 great somebody, a huge possibility. <laughs> That you had somebody in your family lineage that stood at that mount and said, I do. And was cast out because they did not. And now we are receiving our calling to assemble and come back into the reign of our king so that we can inherit the land that we were thrown out of. Hallelujah. So many times, as you can see, the, the Hebrew here plays a huge role. Because if we were to break down just one verse and take it all the way back to the ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics, you might see things that you never thought fathomable. This language is the key to us understanding how to get back into the position with Yahweh and to gain His favor to come back into the reign of Elohim. <coughs> So I want to go ahead and close with a little bit of prayer before we get Jeff set up here. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you again for your language. We thank you for this gathering this evening. Father, and as uh, Jeff begins to come, we just pray that you would anoint his lips as well and that you would just begin to uh, bring your anointing to us. We thank you so much for your word coming forth this evening. And we praise you in the mighty name of Yahshua, our King. Testing, testing. I will not fall down. I will stand my ground. You will fill my cup as the world blows up. When it overflows, I will drop this rose. 